Uh, and welcome. Uh, this is your house. We, we stay upstairs most of the time. You're welcome to walk around downstairs. If I want to take a nap, you can go upstairs. We've got, <laughs> <coughs> got plenty of bedrooms. But uh, I want to thank you all for coming. And, and Hugh is right. And we've discussed this in many places before, the importance of agriculture to South Carolina and thus the importance uh, of it to, to all of you, all who are in the business of getting that agriculture, growing it, and then getting it out to the people. Everyone, I think all the, the leadership, the political leadership and business leadership as well, I think understand the importance of agriculture, not only to South Carolina and, and the families and the farmers, but uh, those who consume it. And that includes people all around the world. And as you know, there, there are a lot of things that we ship out. The Port of Charleston is second to none. It is getting deeper. We're dredging it now. We've gotten the money queue from so far what we need from uh, President Trump. He's been enormously helpful. And it's being dredged out now. And uh, before long, it will be the, the most versatile and deepest harbor on the Atlantic coast. And we can turn around a, a container when it comes in the time they measure it from the time it, that it hit, hits the, the docks down there on the truck to when it gets off and, uh, and, and then again when it gets on the boat. The measurement out in, on the west coast and those ports out there where they have all sorts of problems, as you know, is about two and a half hours what it takes them 26 minutes to do at the Port of Charleston. So we'll, be able, we'll have those big ships will be able to come in day and night, two at a time, just wide and deep. And uh, we're breaking records down there all the time. So as we think about agriculture, we need to think big because we, we can provide things for all over the world. But here, here locally, what, what we want to encourage people to do and, and what there's a growing interest in doing is, is to buy from local producers. People like to know that th this honey came from bees over in Leesville or Batesburg or somewhere else. They like to know where the corn came. They like to know where the where things come from. Uh, my granddaddy was a, a medical doctor in King Street, and he always knew where their vegetables were coming from because they grew them out in the backyard, and he had a lot of patients that paid with collards and cabbage and all that sort of stuff. And we have a big bags of potatoes and things. They came from, from just right out in Williamsburg County. But it's not like that much anymore, as much as it should be. And I know, for example, some, some meat that's brought in that's sold in a lot of the hamburger places sometimes uh, stays in the port of Savannah sometimes for a year or more. It's frozen, it stays there sometimes even longer than that. I mean, it's dead frozen. So, uh, so we, we know that people want to buy locally. And when you can put that certified South Carolina grown sticker on there, it makes a big difference. And in addition with our tourism industry, which rivals agriculture and its importance in income to the state and the economic impact in the state, people coming from around the world that come to South Carolina want to buy. That, that's a part of the South Carolina experience, mm -hmm. is to, to have things here uh, prepared for them that were grown locally. So any way you look at it, agriculture is a great part of South Carolina's future, and the notion of homegrown by farmers in South Carolina uh, is a very important factor in what we're trying to do. That's exactly right. We can put you out there for agriculture yeah. as our spokesman. Okay. <laughs> but, <coughs> you know, as the governor said, it is, it's nothing that not every one of you know and live with uh, in all of your work. A few weeks back, I uh, had the privilege to do the Carolina Business Review with uh, Commissioner Troxler from North Carolina, we talked about these subjects. But one thing that, that made its way into the conversation, uh, that it is a privilege to work with farmers. Uh, I've had that privilege for more than a few years now. Uh, and as the governor said, agriculture is a key part of the future of where we're going. Uh, the certified SC grown has been out there and has great uh, brand identification. Uh, but it's a program. And when we do, we speak to the housewives or the final buyers to say, look for this. But Governor, these are the individuals who make all of the gates open for our South Carolina farmers. Uh, the, the chain, if you will, between the time I grow something and, and it's consumed a lot of steps along the way. And the reason we've asked uh, these folks to join us today, they are key uh, in that chain uh, between the production and consumption. Uh, very efficient industry. It is why 
uh, Americans pay uh, less than any other country in the world for their disposable food. I think less than 10% of their disposable income goes toward food. Well, it starts with the farmer, but it also includes a very efficient uh, system uh, of, of accumulating and distributing, <coughs> and sometimes to, to work with local, as we've talked about, sometimes impacts that efficiencies or it, it, it asks all of these uh, operator, operators to, uh, to look a little differently at the, the normal way that they have gained all those efficiencies. So those are some of the things we want to talk about today, just have a conversation about that and, and how we can raise uh, the, the share, the market share for South Carolina farmers. Yes, sir. My name is Chip Carter. I'm the editor and publisher of SoutheastProduceWeekly.com and the soon to launch Where the Food Comes From.com. I'm also a producer and correspondent with the RFD TV network. Um, I hope you combed your hair today because this revolution will be televised. We will be bringing events from here. Uh, American consumers are making it very, very clear what they want. They want more fruits and vegetables. They want to eat better. They want to eat healthier. They're willing to pay to do that. They want more diversity. They want more variety and they want abundance. Now in this country traditionally when we think of those kind of items, not things that are going, not row crops and for the purposes of today we'll leave meat production off the table, but we're talking about fruits and vegetables, the things that you go in and pick out with your hands and with your eyes and the things that you recognize that when you eat it, it hasn't been processed into something else that you don't recognize. The American consumer has made it loud and clear that's what they want. In this country, when we look at that, we have a tendency to look at California as the production leader, leader, leader. Who's leader in this? California. Who's leader in California? California. Well, of course, California is huge. It's this big. It goes all the way up the West Coast. If we look at the southeastern United States from Florida to Virginia, we very much see equivalencies in terms of what we are able to produce, the variety of items we are able to produce the diversity we are able to produce, the ingenuity of southeastern farmers and the southeastern land-grant universities, the research that's going on there, there's nothing they can do there that we can't do here, and three-quarters of the people in America live on this side of the country, so we've already got this balance. There is unique opportunity for the southeast moving forward to serve this ever-increasing demand for consumers for more. And South Carolina is uniquely positioned to play a pivotal role in this new southeastern power block that we can all form together. Governor, let's, let's talk about South Carolina agriculture history and, and its place in the economy. Uh, there have been people farming in South Carolina as long as there's been South Carolina. It's been the state's leading economic engine for many, many years is today and is likely to be so continuing into the future. That's right. Well, if it didn't farm way back, it didn't eat. <laughs> uh, that's uh, way back uh, with indigo and rice is all, you remember those were the big crops that were shipped all uh, around, around the world. And at the time of the Revolutionary War, South Carolina was the richest colony of them all. It was because of the agricultural strength and that lasted a, a long time. Things, things changed, but things are, to, today, we have an explosion of interest in businesses and people who want to come to good places to live and to work. And uh, in my office and others, uh, we are trying to be sure that whatever doors we can open, whatever advantages we can give to them, in addition to what they see just by looking at South Carolina are available to them to encourage the right, the right kind of, of growth and which produces prosperity, which produces happy, strong people. But the people I talk to from around the world are, are, not, are not interested in the rest of the country. They, they go and they look at these other places, but they want to come to the, the sunny south, the southeast. That's where they want to be. And it's getting to be more and more clear uh, of that. And I hear that from people investing hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in plants 
that you see in the news all the time. And th they say that the, the main reason they say it's beautiful, and they're talking about the, the rural areas as well as the cities, which are all, as you know, are cleaning up and, and getting to be just gorgeous, uh, reaching their, their potential. But they say it's the people. It's the people of South Carolina they meet that make the difference. But they want to, they want to be in South Carolina. All this growth, I'm confident, based on what I've seen, is coming to, to, the, to the southeast. So this is where a lot of the food is grown. And all the, these, the, the, the all kind of crops, and our friends out in California do have a lot of sunshine, but they also have a lot of problems that we don't have, in, including the lack of water. And we are, it's, it's plaguing them. If you've seen Lake Mead in some of those places, it's remarkable it, how it's just it's gone down. Uh, well, we are working now to be sure that we don't have those problems. We are putting together a, a water plan to determine how much we have, how much is on the surface, how much is in the ground, how much is in the rivers, how much do we need to put limits, do we need not to put limits, how can we best manage our resources to be sure that we, that we never run out, because that is uh, that's vital uh, for, for growing things. So the, the action is going to be in South Carolina. It's going to be in the southeast. And the, 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 the growth, the, the crop growth and all that, the potential that we have for that here uh, is, I believe, un, unlimited. And another thing we do they don't do in other places, our research universities all work together. They actually collaborate. They'll share secrets with each other. It's quite remarkable. And when you have Clemson that's been in the business for so long, and you have these other institutions, uh, USC as well as some of the four-year schools that are getting into this research and development, I don't think there's another place in the country that can, can discover things and invent things and put them to work more quickly than we can in South Carolina. So that's why we, we're, we're delighted with our uh, possibility, the, the future of agriculture in South Carolina. I think it's going to, uh, going to grow and to grow and we want to, to be sure that it is a, uh, reaches its potential, not only to keep the people here safe and healthy, but prosperous in the meantime. And we look forward to anything that we know that we can do in order to make that relationship better. It's really important. I really think in a whole lot of things that our state, because of a lot of reasons, we, we can provide a good model for others to follow, to be a leader in many things. Speaking of things that Jim, we're... Let me, let yes, me follow up on the governor's comment about our research uh, universities and something that is also new uh, in the Department of Agriculture. Just over a year ago, we established uh, a, an initiative we call ACRE. So if you've got farming, you're going to use, <laughs> use that for uh, an acronym. It stands for the Agribusiness Center for Research and Entrepreneurship. Uh, on the research side of it, we have focused on our, our purpose is to say to industry, we've started with poultry, we'll probably do some with hemp this year, is to say to industry leaders, what is limiting your expansion in South Carolina? What can we do to facilitate more uh, sourcing from South Carolina, or growth in South Carolina? So we then take those questions and put push them out to the research field and we basically do a request for proposal from people a whole lot smarter than than most of us in the room. I know Thank you smarter very, than y'all. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> we push it out and say give us answers and, and, and don't give half of the money to the university. Don't spend all your time. We, we want to we wanna get these answers to try to unlock some codes. You know, we'll crack the code if you will of expansion in South Carolina. So that's new that will not replace what the universities do. Their, their goal is uh, how to grow more efficiently or, or keep the food safer. Ours is to look at an industry perspective. What does it take for South Carolina to, to grow even more through the, through the research side of, of this initiative? So this is brand new. Well, I think we all continue, we, we all see the, the wisdom in continuing to invest heavily in agriculture. Uh, it's one of the best ROIs you can get because when you get it right, it pays back, and that leads us to some of some of South Carolina's ag all stars. I, I think I hope everybody in this room already knows about South Carolina peaches. Now, no offense, I, I know there's some Georgia folks in this room, 
and no offense, but that license plate needs to be handed over, just handed across the state line. Let them have that. We were with Mr. Bob Stafford from the Vidalia Onion Committee Monday, and he offered a trade. He said he would give up the peach and they will put a Vidalia Onion on the Georgia license plate. I thought that was probably a good idea. Yeah, so, they ain't gonna do that. I don't know, I don't think, I don't think he actually will. I don't think Bob has the authority to do that, but, uh, but I thought it was a, a, a nice gesture to put on the table. But, uh, Commissioner Weathers, we, we do know, we should know that, that peaches are a South Carolina all-star and it's a hallmark crop, it's a legacy crop for the state, but it's not the only, the, the, the governor mentioned some of the things that, that began with us from the beginning, like rice, and they're still right there playing Make today. Uh -huh. You know, peaches are, I, I did a quote for uh, one of the mag state magazines, I call it peach preseason. It's when we know Mother Nature is not going to deal us a blow. Oh, let's hope there's no hailstorms. Uh, let's assume there are no hailstorms, but we know that we've got a great crop coming on. Uh, we can already taste it especially when you get to July with the free stones uh, and the large peaches that just, just wear an old shirt when you eat them because you know you're going to have half of it on your shirt. But it's a great time to, to be in South Carolina knowing that that crop's out there ready to come in. But as you said, uh, peaches are not our only. They are a signature crop for us. Uh, but you all know what's out there with the watermelons, tomatoes, uh, leafy greens coming on uh, with some new ways of growing it as well. We'll talk about that as much with some new technologies in South Carolina. So, you know, South Carolina is the 40th largest state by size in the country. We're probably the smallest state outside of New England, uh, but our population is what, 25th, I think, in the country. But right also, the being, being as small as we are, we've got quite a diverse production basket. Uh, we're not known for any uh, one thing. Uh, we just known that we do a lot of things well. Uh, our state vegetable of collards, uh, great uh, opportunities there. Got some folks growing collards in greenhouses. So the future uh, will have a lot of new stars based on what risks our farmers are willing to take. Uh, and that's again going back to that research piece that we were talking about earlier. And on, on that point, another uh, thing about, about our size, for whatever reason, it seems that everybody in the state knows everybody else. Those you're not related to, you at least know them fairly well. But that, that gives us a great advantage over some other places, and that's with one phone call you can, you can get something done. And if, if you can't call the person that can do it, that person will know the one to call. And the government can respond sometimes uh, very quickly on, on a dime to make a change, to, to make something, to open a door. And that's, uh, I think that's unique to South Carolina, that ability to move that quickly. So and very often that's very important in agriculture. So we're, we're available and we, we are, we're looking for ways to make things work better. Give an example, when we faced crisis hurricanes, it seemed like we we're uh, doing more of that, the governor more than once has lifted uh, weight restrictions for delivering feed out to farms mm -hmm. so that they, they, you know, the poultry operators don't go without. And, and uh, we can do it more efficiently. So his point is, from the governor's office right through every state agency that I work with, if there's a problem, we work together to, uh, to get it solved. My uh, regulatory arm in the Department of Agriculture, we, we, our goal is to educate and then regulate. Uh, so we are there to, to be a partner, and I think that's uh, proven very effective. Well then for both of you, I mean diversity is a hallmark of South Carolina agriculture and, and we know the all-stars and the producers and the cash cows and the things that we can count on coming through the gate, but what, what other kind of things are on the radar? What are some of these guys looking at? Controlled atmosphere and controlled environment growing, uh, hot houses, greenhouses, vertical growing, urban farming, every, what are some of the things that are on the radar? What, what's coming that, that we might not know about in this room? Well, you've mentioned a few. We, like uh, in your some surrounding states, South Carolina does have investment coming in controlled environment agriculture on the farmer's market campus and working with uh, Gary Prince and those at Sin Brothers. Uh, they, well, there you are. I was looking over there. Uh, <coughs> is, is a great uh, entrepreneurial spirit that you're seeing in agriculture. Uh, like other states, one of our challenges is the average age of farmers. Uh, 
uh, it's 58 plus in South Carolina. We want to show them that if you have that uh, that entrepreneurial spirit, that risk taking uh, initiative, there are ways to be profitable as a as an agriculture producer. You don't have to do it the way your fathers or grandfathers did. There are plenty of, of things. Uh, when we had the flood of 2015, and we had a an assistance program that the state funded, uh, we helped farmers help growers of 28 different crops, not just your corn and soybeans and collards, and but 28 different crops that I can't even name now. Just it just told me just what a diversified uh, production basket we have. Well, I think when we talk about this kind of production, we always tend to think in terms of fresh, 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 fresh fruits and vegetables, fresh produce, fresh market. But the consumers made it very clear, sure, they love fresh, but they'll buy it in a can and they'll buy it in a freezer pack. They'll buy it. They want the fruits and vegetables is what they want. And there's, there are convenience issues. Um, South Carolina has kind of been a trailblazer in that the process inside. And from a farmer's standpoint, whether it winds up in the produce department, in a can on a shelf, or in a freezer bag, it doesn't matter. Somebody still had to grow that, and somebody still got paid for it. So let's talk about South Carolina's processing capabilities beyond fresh. Well, when, when you move beyond fresh, you do have some flexibility in harvest, uh, and which maybe allows you to harvest mechanically versus uh, with labor. And that is a challenge. It's no, no surprise to any that going forward, the hand-picked crops uh, will be challenged by labor issues. And um, so we, we hope that those are solved and we have a, a viable guest worker program going forward. But moving sort of away from fresh to, to process, again, uh, the, the flexibility of, of harvest is a positive one because some of our traditional farmers who uh, a little bit timid about moving away from the combine drivers. If you know who those are, I'm, I'm one of them, uh, who farm the same way for four generations. To move into vegetables, you know, perhaps the, the canned market or the frozen market where uh, they, they have a little more flexibility might be a way that we can, can move some of them in that direction. Well, over the last few weeks, we have personally watched as Florida strawberry growers have had to plow fields under because they had no market for them. And we see this as we go. There is afterlife. There's no reason for us to be plowing fields under and, and, and putting field under. So I think there's incredible room for the processing sector to grow and to continue to grow. Now, part of what makes all of this possible, from the processing to the fresh to the movement and everything, is South Carolina's location really a central hub of the southeast with the infrastructure to support all of these efforts from highways to port to rail to air to whatever access you need is already in place here in South Carolina. Well that's right we the, the state system alone there are a lot of, in a lot of other a lot of other states you have county roads and others that are in the uh, county system but we got boy I, I can't remember the exact number but we're right at the top in the miles of state maintained roads uh, in, in the United States. There's a road, and they were built there for that purpose, and that was the, the farm to market. That's what it was all about. So we, we have a great system with the interstates coming through with the, with the ports, uh, the, the inland port in Dillon and the, the other one in, in Greer. We, we've, got a, we've got an infrastructure, a transportation infrastructure they don't have anywhere else. And located where we are, I don't remember the numbers, but uh, you go out 500 miles or along, whatever it is, we, we're right in the center of what you just said is an enormous market. And every one of those places you can get to from right here. It's pretty much a, a two days drive yeah. to about 80% of the U.S. population. <clears throat> That's right. That's right. <clears throat> so we talk about this and we're talking about this, this focus on local and this focus on fresh and certainly the the certified SC grown program has been a huge success and and we hope everybody in this room will support and take advantage of that but I hope m maybe there is a growing awareness that my neighbor is my friend whereas my neighbor a little further away is not as good a friend is there any thought to this this positioning this cooperative competition um, if I'm in Georgia I much prefer to have a South Carolina peach than a California peach. 
And if I'm in South Carolina, I'd much prefer to have a Georgia onion than a Mexican onion. Do you, do you see that sense of that competitive cooperation in the southeastern states and, and being able to utilize that as a marketing advantage? Well, from my perspective, most of the commissioners around the southeast are elected officials. There are 12 of us around the country who are elected most in the southeast, and we have a good working relationship, again, on behalf of advancing agriculture. Uh, and I think, and we've had discussions of farm to school, how do you look beyond just your state lines to make sure that uh, farm to school and getting better quality uh, product in front of the school kids all around the southeast? How could you do that better? Uh, as we know, uh, departments of education manage the, the school food nutrition program. Well, can we do better if more states move that to the Department of Agriculture? It's happened in Florida. It's happened in Texas. Uh, North Carolina is considering it. So that's, a, that's one example that I do believe uh, the Southeast as a whole uh, can be very competitive. Yeah, and there's plenty of competition uh, uh, between us all, and that's good. Uh, that's what makes the, the best rise to the top. Also, there's a, to part of your point is that there's a, a growing sense of, of regionalism. And with, uh, with communication being instant in, in everywhere, travel being so easy, you, you, you don't even have to leave home. You can go with FaceTime and those things, just a simple example. But there's a, <coughs> we've sensed a growing understanding and need for some, some regional cooperation. And one small example of that would be the, the uh, issue now we're having, we're, we're hoping that we can get the Panthers, the football team, to set up their headquarters in York County. There's a great article about it in the state paper this morning. Uh, two states, one team is there what they, uh, Mr. Richardson coined that phrase and Mr. Tepper, who is the new owner, he's following up on that. It, it hadn't been seen so much as a South Carolina team because all the games were played in Charlotte, although they had their practice at Walford College. But now they're talking about going just over the line, just a few miles away and having uh, having the, the practice facility, the offices, a lot of the athletes, of course, will move to, to the area to be closer. Uh, so they won't have to travel, but they will have a hospital complex, hotel complex, convention center, and they think of having light rail, if possible, from Charlotte, which of course is in North Carolina, down to Fort Mill or, or Rock Hill or somewhere in there. This regional, uh, regional concept of working together on, on things that benefit everybody are coming more and more to the front as communication uh, and growth uh, takes place and travel is made so easy. So the, the, the things that opens up for agriculture seem to me to be in a place that, that grows as much as we do seem to be uh, uh, phenomenal. And also has the infrastructure already in place it's to support here. that and can, and, suppo and can support continued That's right. growth. That's right. And further growth. And Commissioner, I understand that you had a personal experience last summer during peach season that's something you hope you will never see again. I don't know if you want to tell it or you want me to. <laughs> if I'm we, not, won't, we won't name names, we won't call out names. No, but, we just, yeah. uh, when I uh, make it down the aisles of the grocery stores, uh, you know, you'll look at the labels and sometimes there's some non-commissioner words that I say to myself if you see them from California or from wherever when it's our peach season. And if I don't do it personally, uh, my chief shopping consultant reminds me <laughs> of it. So, uh, you know, everybody, <coughs> We recognize when our window of, of opportunities are, uh, and literally when it comes to fruit and harvest. So we just want to make that point that when it's South Carolina's uh, peak harvest season, we really, our South Carolina shoppers want to see it and want to see that we collectively have done our job to put that South Carolina product out there. And I would take that one step further and say that when it's South Carolina peach season or any other season, that shoppers in Tennessee and North Carolina and Georgia and Alabama and Florida would rather see that South Carolina product than see product that came from further away. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, I think that's, that is why we are all here today is to, is to begin this conversation and to look at, again, this, this power block. All you got to do is look at a map. 
Here's a picture of giant California. Here's a picture of all these little bitty states over here. It said, put us together, and there's nothing little bitty about us. We've got a unique opportunity to work together and set up a future. And we've come to the point now, we're getting close enough to getting some of this food that we've been talking about and eating it. Um, <clears throat> but we do have some time for, for some questions and some dialogue. And uh, right now, you've got these two gentlemen pinned in on either side on this couch. They're kind of hemmed in, and I don't think they can get away. So we would love to open the floor for questions. If anybody's got any question, comment. Make one more comment. Yes, sir. You know, we've talked a lot about our uh, brethren on the West Coast, which includes my sister, by the way. So if you know my sister, don't tell her we were talking about her. But anyway, to leave beyond the TV that, off. we all know the statistics. If you love seafood, there's an 85 percent chance it came from somewhere else in the world. But if I'm not mistaken, on on fruits, we've surpassed 50 percent imported. And on vegetables, we're bumping 30%. Now, granted, a lot of what we like to eat, we don't grow in the United States. But the point is, I think we need to be keenly aware of that as those trends are only going up. Uh, the American consumer has gotten accustomed to a natural uh, a birthright of paying the least of anyone in the world for the highest quality food, you know, perhaps there's a little wiggle room that uh, if that food comes from the United States, if it comes from the Southeast, you know, they're willing to, to maybe come out of the pocket just a fraction to know that in the long run uh, that farmer will be supported and we won't be dependent on food from other places That's in the right. world. That maybe don't think as highly of us as we do. Well, I've heard it said many times before, <laughs> if you thought that we were over a barrel when we became dependent on foreign oil, imagine where we will be if we ever become dependent on foreign food. Now, if anybody else would like to talk, I'd love to let you. Has anybody got a question, a comment, something they'd like to, to, to add into this thing? Don't even raise your hand, just jump in and, and say, like yes, say sir. I just say our, our, our peaches are just as good and our cows are just as happy <laughs> as anybody in California. So, I started picking peaches here when I was 13 years old. And, uh, there isn't anything better. I just had one question. What, uh, as just a percentage right now, what percentage of our overall crop production do you think is staying in the southeast and what's being shipped out of the southeast? I think during the height of the season, obviously we've got to look elsewhere. Just last night, uh, we were in New Jersey talking to the northeastern groups, similar. So, uh, overall, Agriculture export exports out of the country 30% of its production. I don't think that applies to fruit and vegetables, but when it's peak season, uh, we do need to find other markets, and we are looking at the East Coast as our second market to South Carolina. But of, I don't have I don't know percentage. One, one other quick question: How how much of our South Carolina certified grown product currently do you? Do we have any idea of how much of that is actually making it into a processed or frozen package? Well, we have a separate certified South Carolina product, and that's mainly your um, specialty crops and things, especially foods. Uh, you know what percentage is going into <coughs> canned or frozen? Uh, I would guess 15 percent. That's strictly knowing the, the primary operators in South Carolina. I just thought uh, you mentioned earlier about some of the universities and colleges doing research, and, and I wondered if any of that research was going towards uh, seeing if South Carolina can grow some crops that California may grow abundantly or Texas may grow abundantly. Um, everybody in this room probably knows the celery market right now is uh, people are paying in the 60s and 70 dollars a box because one big conglomerate decided not to plant as much this year out, out west. So, so and, and I'm just picking that as an example. Uh, Florida has done a great job marketing lettuce, iceberg lettuce on this side of the Mississippi. And I just wondered if, if, if there's an opportunity for South Carolina to have, uh, to be able to market something new if the research indicates it would flourish here. 
I don't know what that is. And if I can set this one up for you, I'd be delighted to. <clears throat> I've spent a lot of time out in these South Carolina fields with this camera and this crew and and the places that we go, a lot of times when we go to a farm, we show up and we go, well, this is all lovely, now show us where the secret stuff is. <laughs> so it's the stuff that they grow on the West Coast that you're trialing here. And every last one of them looks at us and goes, how do you know about that? You know, and the answer is because some of these, there have been varieties that have come out of, out of the research universities that have adapted Western crops to Eastern climates. And from what I've seen, we are quite successfully producing broccoli, cauliflower, different lettuces. I'll let you jump in and... Well, I know for years we've always asked, can we grow a West Coast cantaloupe over here? And we, we talked about that. Um, but I will say this, if, if President Clements of Clemson were here, I do see on their part a renewed interest, uh, commitment to what put that university there. Uh, and That's that right. was an agricultural, uh, and then subsequently re research in agriculture and extension. So uh, again, with the governor's support, their, their ability to bring researchers on, Steve, to, to go out either the vegetable lab at Charleston or wherever around the state, I see a renewed interest. So what the answer is today, I hope that the answer to that question in three years is, is more optimistic uh, based on their commitment. I know this, they're always looking for new ideas. And, and if you have one, you need to tell somebody, I'd say tell Hugh and let him send it to, in the right channels because they, in all my contact with those folks, they're always looking for the next thing and they collaborate with each other. And, and it, when you get all those people working together, it's just quite a powerful force. That's the things that'll grow here. I know they brought some kudzu over from Japan a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's doing pretty good. Governor, if we could eat it, we'd all be in good shape. Well, but, maybe uh, we can find a way. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, in the, in the larger part of that, knowing, looking at the new regulations and the new things that are in play, we understand that every time you send a truck east from California, you're looking at another six to $8,000 FOB cost that did not exist just 24 months ago. So we are, we don't have to make these moves. We don't have to make these investments. We don't have to do this research and we don't have to do these trials, but we'd be kind of dumb if we didn't. So they're out there, they're working that every day. And I would say that from, from a retail and wholesale, a wholesale perspective, I'd be willing to bet commissioner that if there's something that any of the people in this room would like to see a farmer try down here, somebody will step up and try it. Uh, I think so. Farmers never shy away from a challenge, and I'll tell you, uh, I'll see it again. I, I said at the opening, it's a privilege to work with them. Uh, some of them are a little bit stubborn, uh, but we want to find those who are willing, again, to not necessarily 100% risk averse, uh, willing to, to step out on that uh, curve. I'll tell you earlier, and we mentioned briefly controlled environment agriculture, had a trip last year to look at how they do things in the Netherlands a country half the size of South Carolina that has a higher, the second highest export percentage of their food. Uh, years ago they said we won't be hungry again and we won't be dependent on others. So they made that commitment somewhere between what they've done with uh, greenhouse farming uh, and what we're doing is an answer. But I mean, we're seeing it. We're seeing it in North Carolina, great greenhouse operators in Georgia, uh, have some in South Carolina. I think that's a potential answer to that West Coast uh, competition. And they will keep looking for more answers. I believe we've got time for one more in this room before we move on to lunch. Has anybody got anything else? On uh, my top movers uh, in our stores, one of them would be potatoes. Mm. Uh, of course, collards uh, are up there as well, but uh, this past season when collards were hurt so bad, it, I always uh, told them it's it's like cocaine between Thanksgiving and New Year's. And if you don't have college, you're in trouble. So uh, all of us were in, were in trouble. But uh, my question is, if, if potatoes are up there, why haven't we in, in the Southeast offered more potatoes? Uh, packaged. Because packaged is the way the consumer buys them mostly. We know we do sweet potatoes. But I'm talking white or something that could compete 
to where we wouldn't have to go outside the state and buy so many potatoes because that's a top crop for us. Well, we do know that it's attracted some interest in the last four or five years, and the governor spoke to the water issue, and we know if you're we're in South Carolina or read any of our papers, you know that there was some pushback. So again, I think it's imperative that we manage the water uh, resource so that 60 years from now, we still have it. Uh, but the potato farmers who came here probably slowed down that momentum by a few years based on, based on some of the initial reactions. I think we're getting beyond them and I think the, the sandy soil that they came for will attract others. Uh, we see it. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that uh, once we get our future sort of mapped out with water resources, that we'll see an uptick in that. We want to thank everybody for coming out today and joining this conversation. Now we're going to move to the dining room, but I want to make clear that this is not the end. This discussion that we've started here in the last five minutes with you asking questions, you ask, Let's continue that around this table and let's make this the beginning of the dialogue, not a start and stop point.